Hey everybody, thank you for listening to Rant Brickers. Let's talk about racism. I'm an old-fashioned enough guy where racism is hard for me to talk about. And it's hard for me to talk about without using possibly incorrect terms. Uh, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to listen around my old-fashionedness. Most of us think we know what racism is. It's a white guy saying, I don't like black people. It's a white guy acting like he doesn't like black people. But racism is more subtle than that. It's actually um, became unfashionable here about 35 years ago. And uh, we are living in a world that's transitioning. One thing, when you read history, you have to understand that people back then had a way of looking at the world. They had a cultural mindset that is different from ours. Um, when you read about history, when you read about different people in different places, when you read about cats who want to interrupt your video session, what you will quickly find out is that it doesn't do any good to judge these people. They're all dead. All we can do is describe how they thought and understand how those make thinking errors that we don't want to repeat. And my co-star Angel, by the way. Say hello, Angels. Okay. So, this cultural set of tools and looking at things is always changing. It's always evolving. That's how come publicly it's not polite to admit to racism anymore, even though some people still do hold that position. A lot of people think they're not racist anymore, and may or may not be. They haven't examined their own assumptions closely enough to really find out. Um, I was educated about racism by my dad. My dad was born in 1912 in North Carolina. His set of cultural equipment was different than mine. Um, and what his belief was, was that there are different types of human being. And that black human beings are different as a class from white human beings and that Asian human beings are different as a class from black human beings or white human beings okay now he thought he'd overcome his racism because he didn't necessarily hate anybody for belonging to one or another of these groups but the existence of these groups was rock solid for him he he would not believe that this was not the case when I was much younger, I called him out on it. I told him he was being racist, and he was hurt because he didn't understand. He didn't hate black people. He just thought black people were a different kind of people. I was raised in a world where I'm one of the I'm one of the first of a generation where we were raised with racism being wrong from the get-go. Um, the generation just before me, the baby boomers, they were fed racist stuff by their parents and then told later that it was wrong. Now, as the first of a transitional generation, my thoughts, my beliefs, my cultural equipment are going to be betwixt and between. And I don't know what the future is going to look like. I don't know what kids three generations from now are going to think of as the proper way to think about race. Um, all I can do is do the best I can right now. I remember reading a, uh, a Scientific American article about race. I also remember reading Richard Dawkins on the subject. And what Richard Dawkins pointed out was interesting. He took a little clip of two pieces of forehead, right? That's where you get a pretty broad strip of hair, of skin, 
and it's a relatively consistent color. And he showed the two splotches of skin side by side. And then he zoomed out and told us that the darker skin belonged to George W. Bush and the lighter skin belonged to Colin Powell, even though we call George W. Bush white and Colin Powell black. The fact of the matter is what we respond to as white and what we respond to as black is much more subtle and much more intricate than just skin color. Um, and uh, the Scientific American article I read uh, pointed out that you can't scientifically determine race. The concept is so broad and so fluid and so subjective that any time you set objective boundaries and say this is one race, this is another, you'll find members of one race who are def who who are definitely one race that race, but share but cross that boundary line and render your definition useless. So anthropologically, the idea of race is almost almost in the history books at this point and it's considered not a terribly useful measure. Um, that leaves the cultural effect, which I'm not certain I'm all that I'm all that competent to talk about. But I can talk about my experience. Um, eventually I came to a belief called individualism. I believe that each human being specifically is valuable. That every human being is endowed by their creation with certain rights and certain prerogatives. And working backwards from that, that means there are certain things about them that should not be trampled, should not be violated. And if you do it, you're wrong. I also believe in my heart of hearts there are certain things about each specific human being that are wonderful even if it's only something potentially wonderful and I believe that the idea of putting people into collectives of considering people as groups but not considering their individual existence I think that leads to problems I think that's a bad idea racism is collectivism by skin tone or whatever that subsurface emotional thing we're reacting to when we identify somebody by race um, the fact of the matter is it seems like the individual humans vary so much from one to the other that most blanket categories like race, like class, don't hold all the people you want to put in it. There will be somebody who lies outside that. And whatever quality you want to assign to another box, there will be people you put in the first box who have the quality you associate with your second box. Boxes are easy. We are categorizing creatures. We like to generalize from the specific to the general but that doesn't work with human beings very well and so you could say men are generally stronger than women but when you try to measure that very specifically you will find women who are stronger than men you'll find very strong women and you'll find very weak men um, so saying generally women are generally men are physically stronger than women it has a vague sort of possible useless usefulness but in talking about any specific person it's useless and it's the same with any description of race if you know if you know guy x is black you actually don't know anything about him you may know something about his skin color, but not even then. You know that he may have certain physical or facial characteristics, but you don't know to what degree. You don't know how, that ex how that's expressed. Race doesn't tell you about any individual human being. And that's why it's 
really not useful. It doesn't give you any information about the next person you meet walking down the road. Okay. My dad thought that this did, and I was unable to change his mind. Of course, I was young, and so I wasn't good at talking about these sorts of things. And so I made several errors in talking to him that uh, hardened, that, of, that hurt his feelings and left him in a position that he didn't want to change his mind. And so my experience is I've never changed any racist's mind away from being a racist. Okay. Um, now, the next question is how does this concept interact with the non-aggression principle? Now, over on one of the two anarcho-capitals on Facebooks, we just had a huge debate roll through about that. And I skimmed part of it, but I think George Gian Coppolis pretty much nailed it. Uh, you don't have to tolerate racists in your libertarian community if you don't want to. If you want to protest, if you want to picket, if you want to racist shame them until they go away, well, then in your in your anti-racist libertarian community that's fine okay um i don't know how helpful that would be okay i don't know how well that would really help communicate and promote the idea of individualism but if you want to say that people are beyond help if you want to say they're unrecoverable that's your bag um, I would like to think that's not the case I would like to think that eventually if we're able to display by example how individualism makes things better that uh, we'd persuade people um, explaining why individualism is a better idea seems to be taking a very long time and not working very well at all and not be working very well at all. Or English, I talk the English good. Derp de derp de derp. Um, but really, right now, persuasion is the tool I got. I hope to be able to show by example at some point. To be able to say, yeah, see, freedom works. Um, and. Uh, Here's a question. Uh, in two generations, what kind of things are peak kids going to hold in their minds as everybody knows it's true, as assumptions about the world? Well, they'll look at us and our ways of thinking and go, how could you think that? How could you think that? Um, when you look back in history and find the ways in which people's brains were people's opinions about things, are different and uh, the beliefs they hold are different now their brains are the same it's the same same organ for the last 200,000 years but the set of cultural tools we load into our brain that is um, that is different and it evolves over time not as fast as people think but it does and um, it just amuses me you know what things that you hold you know dear what things that you hold to be self-evident, what cherished notions that you have are going to be looked back in the future at people are going to say, I can't believe you believed that. I'd hate to think, I'd hate to think we're heading towards a future where individualism is viewed that way. But you can probably find places out in the wild now, out in, the, out in academia, out in colleges, we're saying, you know, individualism first individuals first you can't help a you can't help a minority group by stepping on individual members of that minority you can't help an indi a minority group by stepping on individuals from any other group doesn't work like that and people look at you like oh my god are you crazy you're insane you're mad you're racist so we are living now in a transitionary time we're living now where in a time where our ideas about race are becoming quickly obsolete. 
Um, and I don't want to denigrate the struggle of anybody who's had to carry around other, the effects of other people's assumptions about them. Um, I don't want to denigrate the experience of somebody who gets pulled over for driving while black. Uh, the people in New York who got stopped and frisked, by far the majority of them were black and Latino because the cops could see that and to the to the mind of those people it seemed like that was a that was a set a group that seemed more likely to be criminal and so we see people every day who have to carry around the burden of other people's assumptions and that sucks and I would like not to add to that burden. And I would like to be able to, at some point to help lighten that burden. Um, there are a certain group of people, well, a certain group of people, there have been individuals in the liberty movement who have said these things in, approximate, in a similar vein to what I'm about to tell you. They say that uh, the libertarian movement, that the freedom movement sucks because it's not anti-racist enough. I find that to be sort of missing the point, right? If you are, you know, if you're anti-pink Volkswagen, you hate all pink Volkswagens, you think pink Volkswagens are a blight upon humanity, okay, and you join the libertarian movement and then say, the libertarian movement, you need to be more upset about pink Volkswagens. Pink Volkswagens are a demonstrable evil on the face of the earth, and you are not upset about it. You are not doing enough to stamp out pink Volkswagens, okay? You see what I'm saying there? I'm drawing a script for you. I want you to behave in a certain way. I want you to feel in a certain way. I want you to think in a certain way. And I am telling you that I am angry at you because you are not acting like I want, thinking like I want, feeling like I want. Be as anti-racist as you got to be. But don't get angry at me when I don't follow your script or seem to be following your script okay we all have our own struggles we all have our own problems we all have our own road to hoe okay I like to think that I'm anti-racist I think that uh, kids two or three generations from now will look at me like I'm completely retarded and off the wall but right now I'm doing the best I can and I don't appreciate being told that I'm not good enough because I'm not stridently anti-pink Cadillac enough or anti-this enough or anti-that enough, right? We're living in a world where people think that if somebody has a bad idea, it's okay to hurt them. It's okay to take their stuff. It's okay to rob and steal and injure and assault people because where their mom's VJJ was when they were born. We live in a world where people do not understand that, uh, no, when we say love one another, we're uh, not just kidding, right? At least respect one another to the point where you're not hitting, when you're not stealing, when you're not lying. Okay? So that is a big struggle. That's that's a hard one. So somebody runs up and says anti racism and we say, Whoa, whoa, make sure we make sure we got the that non aggression principle and you say, Oh no, you know, you, you like you you're willing to tolerate racism if you if you if you put the nap first. No. I think we have a lot of work to go to go before we can take the nap for granted. I think we have a lot of work to go before we can take take it for granted, you know, that people aren't going to say, you know, nuke all the Arabs. I mean, I've heard people say that. 
you know and it's not that it's not that the two or three people I've heard say that it's not that I think they would actually go and hurt or kill some Arab person just standing there it's that they don't want to empathize they don't want to see that that's a human being there they don't want to have their hearts open to that idea and I find that a little scary so yeah yeah we got, got a little bit of work ahead of us to, to let people know that the non-aggression principle means everybody everybody okay and I think it'll work best if you treat it pretty pretty much absolutely now life is slippery life is squishying has lots of gray areas so you know at some point you may be falling and have to grab onto somebody's flagpole to save yourself okay then we get into the corollary of uh, the non-aggression principle don't be an asshole but um, I'm hoping that we will get be able to get to a point where we can display we can show by our actions that the non-aggression principle that you can have a voluntary society that you can have a society that does not aggress and uh, you know after that huge huge hurdle is is taken you know then I will then no, that doesn't sound right. Then I'll join the anti anti racism crusade. No, I'm anti racist now. I think it's a bad idea now. I just don't like being told I'm not screaming it loud enough. Okay. So that's this one. I think I'll jump into my other one here. Because this is on the topic of that kind of prejudice. Um I'm a large person. I am rotund. I am overweight. Recently on my Facebook page, somebody uh, fat shamed me about it. Okay. This person was a bully. Bullies allowed to feel morally superior. I posted an old picture of myself where I was skinny about 20 years ago, 22 years ago now. And. I said, this is me back when I was skinny. And they said, well, you could be again if you wanted to. And I said, neat, judgmentalism. He said, er, self-pity. Because he wants to tell himself that, you know, it's a matter of getting up and doing five jumping jacks and then you'll be thin. It's your choice. Right? Because that way he can feel morally superior. Okay? And that's really what this is about. Because that guy... He did nothing to help me. He did nothing to support me. People who are overweight fight a battle every day. Every day. Every time you get up. Every time you try to do anything. Being overweight makes it harder. Sometimes really hard. Okay? And sometimes there may be other issues in play. I'm not going to go into detail here because I don't want to sound like I'm making excuses. But the fact of the matter is, you know, it's not just a matter of doing five jumping jacks. Okay. Fact of the matter is, for some of us, it can be quite a struggle. Okay. And uh, the question is, when you meet me, when you talk to me, when you interact with me, are you there to be helpful? Are you there to be supportive? Or are you there to talk about something else because you don't give a crap how much I weigh? Are you there to fat shame? Are you there to display your moral superiority by telling me that my weight is a relatively trivial character flaw? Um, the person who did that to me, I unfriended him. I didn't even bother to block the guy. It wasn't that important not worth that kind of effort. I might later if he, if it turns into a flame thing, but I don't think it will. Um, fact is, I have better boundaries than that, so I don't have to worry about what some loud mouth on the internet says. He says, ah, you suck, and I say, yeah, yeah, bye-bye. Okay, but I wanted to point that out because 
you know, I wanted to point out that there is that prejudice around. And I wanted to point out that it's slipping through as some sort of morally appropriate prejudice. As opposed to, say, racism, which is not. Uh, I don't think fat shaming is any better than slut shaming. Or anything else of that ilk. Uh, looking at my time. Um, so I guess the question is, when you talk to somebody, are you there to try to lift them up? Are you there to try to make things better for them? Are you there to have fun? Are you there to have an interesting conversation? Or are you there to talk about how superior you are? And how much better you are than they? Because I could tell you uh, from experience on both sides, getting up on my high horse does not help me. It does not help me to be helpful to anybody. And I find when I'm helpful to people, I like Jay better. I enjoy being Jay better. When I'm a positive experience in your life, even if it's just making you giggle and stirk, I like being that guy. I enjoy that better than not being that guy. Okay? So, um, yeah, um, fat shaming, nerd shaming. I've been there. I've been on. I've been on uh, the wrong end of both of those. What a dork! Heard it so many times. And um, you know, I don't have time for that kind of negativity anymore. I don't need it. It's cool. You go ahead and go ahead and be negative on your own dime. Okay, go ahead and be negative on your own wall. But uh, just be advised that you know there's helping people and then there's not helping people. And I guess you got to figure, which one do you want to be today? Um, hopefully, we're moving towards a state of better liberty. Hopefully, we're moving towards that place where we cherish each other as individual human beings. I uh, like what uh, Adam Kokesh says when he signs off his show. And I think I've run out the clock enough for this session. Thank you very much for listening to Rant Burgers. You have a good week, and I'll see you next Friday.